affection and value for money. He boasted that D10 cost no more than 10 shillings per square foot. A souvenir pamphlet announces, from the moment of conception, all attention was focused upon the purpose for which the building was intended, production. But somehow, out of this utilitarian chrysalis, has struggled this delicate creature, elegant, insect-like, part Fritz Lang's metropolis, part stage set for the Mikado. Owen Williams, the maestro behind this pharmaceutical pagoda, didn't even train as an architect. He was a self-taught tramway engineer. Williams was dedicated to form dictated only by function, but it's these cantilevered curves, originally designed to hoist goods, that give these towers their strangely oriental elegance. On the west side of the building, a huge canopy, which once hung over Boots' own railway track, supports five glass towers, literally castles in the air. William started his career working for a concrete company and finished it with spaghetti junctions. Yet, like the Boots building, other projects such as his Daily Express buildings in Manchester and Fleet Street display the same shiny elegance that's quintessentially of the 30s. Although it's acknowledged as a masterpiece of early British modernism, very few people have even heard of, much less seen D10, because it's hidden away here on an industrial estate. We usually glimpse these factory complexes through train windows or by the sides of motorways, but they're as big as cities, and they have their own thoroughfares, their own streets, and their own architectural language. D10 is properly known as the wet building because it's designed for the production of liquids. Next door is its ugly sister, the dry building. Also designed by Williams, it has a faintly ocean linerish style, but it lacks the panache of its elegant sister. The utilitarian street signs are unwittingly exotic as they echo the Manhattan street grid. And in fact, it was the States that provided the blueprint for this sort of factory design.